Part 4. A Young Man's Fancy. Chapter 9. From Dr. Samuel Bannerling, M.D. The Maples, Front Street, Toronto, Canada West. To Dr. Simon Jordan, M.D. Care of Mrs. William P. Jordan, Laburnum House, Loomisville, Massachusetts, the United States of America. Redirected. Care of Major C.D. Humphrey, Lower Union Street, Kingston, Canada West. April 20th, 1859. Dear Dr. Jordan, I am in receipt of your request to Dr. Workman of April 2nd concerning the convict Grace Marks and of a note from him asking that I supply you with any further information at my disposal. I must inform you at once that Dr. Workman and I have not always seen eye to eye. In my estimation, and I was at the asylum far more years than he has yet been there, his policies of leniency have led him to undertake a fool's errand, namely the transforming of Sal's ears into silk purses. Most who suffer from the more severe nervous and cerebral disorders cannot be cured, but merely controlled, for which purposes physical restraint and correction, a restricted diet, and cupping and bleeding to reduce excessive animal spirits have in the past proven efficacious enough. Although Dr. Workman claims to have obtained positive results in several cases previously considered hopeless, these supposed cures will no doubt in time prove to have been superficial and temporary. The taint of insanity is in the blood and cannot be removed with a little soft soap and flannel. Dr. Workman had the opportunity of examining Grace Marks for a few weeks only, whereas I had her under my care for over a year, and therefore his opinion on the subject of her character cannot be worth a great deal. He was, however, perspicacious enough to discover one pertinent fact, namely that, as a lunatic, Grace Marks was a sham, a view previously arrived at by myself, although the authorities of that time refused to act upon it. Continuous observation of her, and of her contrived antics, led me to deduce that she was not, in fact, insane, as she pretended, but was attempting to pull the wool over my eyes in a studied and flagrant manner. To speak plainly, her madness was a fraud and an imposture, adopted by her in order that she might indulge herself and be indulged. The strict regimen of the penitentiary, where she had been placed as a just punishment for her atrocious crimes, not having been to her liking. She is an accomplished actress and a most practiced liar. While among us, she amused herself with a number of supposed fits, hallucinations, caperings, warblings, and the like, nothing being lacking to the impersonation but Ophelia's wildflowers entwined in her hair. But she did well enough without them, as she managed to deceive not only the worthy Mrs. Moody, who, like many high-minded females of her type, is inclined to believe any piece of theatrical twaddle served up to her, provided it is pathetic enough, and whose inaccurate and hysterical account of the whole sad affair you have no doubt read. But also, several of my own colleagues, this latter being an outstanding example of the old rule of thumb, that when a handsome woman walks in through the door, good judgment flies out through the window. Should you, nonetheless, decide to examine Grace Marks at her current place of abode, be pleased to consider yourself amply warned. Many older and wiser heads have been enmeshed in her toils, and you would do well to stop your ears with wax, as Ulysses made his sailors do to escape the sirens. She is as devoid of morals as she is of scruples, 
and will use any unwitting tool that comes to hand. I should alert you also to the possibility that once having involved yourself in her case, you will be besieged by a crowd of well-meaning but feeble-minded persons of both sexes, as well as clergymen, who have busied themselves on her behalf. They pester the government with petitions for her release, and will attempt in the name of charity to waylay you and conscript you. I have had repeatedly to beat them away from my door, whilst informing them that Grace Marks has been incarcerated for a very good reason, namely the vicious acts which she has committed, and which were inspired by her degenerate character and morbid imagination. To let her loose upon an unsuspecting public would be irresponsible to the last degree, as it would merely afford her the opportunity of gratifying her bloodthirsty tastes. I am confident that, should you choose to explore the matter further, you will arrive at the same conclusions as have already been arrived at by your obedient servant, Dr. Samuel Bannerling. M.D.